In 2 Peter, Peter, the first chapter in, in verse 4, it says this, by which he has given us exceeding great and precious promises. I like this verse. That through these, through these what? Through these exceeding great and precious promises. That you may be partakers of what? Oh, my. That you might be partake. What? Listen, we're talking about exceeding great and precious promises. And there's a lot of great promises in the Bible. He's, he's your help in a time of trouble. He'll supply your need according to his riches and glory. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. In my Father's house, there's many dwelling places. I, there's just so many promises. In this verse where he talks about exceeding great and precious promises, this is what he talks about. This is one of those promises. To allow you to be a partaker of the divine nature. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what virtue is. To partake of the divine nature of God and have it work in your life in this lifetime. Having escaped... Now, listen, so many times we're trying to escape sin. The key to overcoming sin is focus on the nature of God. I've said this a lot of times. Sometimes as Christian, we are more sin conscious than we are God conscious. If you never read read any of E.W. Kenyon, you, 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 you should. Now, if you read a couple of Kenyon's books, you've read them. You know, he's written about 12 of them, but read two and you'll be done. But the the issue of being sin conscious and God conscious. So, so many times we're we're, we're just doing our very best with great sincerity to not fail, to not sin. And we we just try and we try and we try and we we stub our toe and we fall and we fail and we become discouraged. I'm going to tell you something to be a huge help to you. Focus on his nature. The divine nature of God. The nature of God will help you to do what you never could do yourself. We're talking about gifts, things that he, he endows us with, that which he gives to us. We don't earn them. We don't deserve them. We are what? We are born with them. We are born with them. Partakers of the divine nature. Developing virtues or, or character is the only means of bridging the gap between belief and practice. See, without, the, without that divine nature, without his character working in our lives, we may have all the right beliefs, but not have the inward strength and the inward gifts and the inward tools to be able to live it out in our daily lives. Developing virtues or character bridges the gap. And we all know that many times there's a huge gap between belief and practice. See, what God does when he comes into our lives, and and all these that were here this morning who made a public expression of faith are saying this, I'm a new person. When it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. What is a new creature? It's something that didn't previously exist. It means this, that you have taken on a new nature. Your nature has changed. There was a reason that I sinned habitually before I came to Christ. By nature, I was a sinner. I was a professional. Don't laugh at me. You were a professional. Life is equal opportunity. But when Christ comes into our lives, we become a new creation. We become partakers of the divine nature of God. Let's look at another verse, Colossians 3, 9, and 10, important to the virtue training Bible. Put off the old man with his deeds. And put on what? The new man. What do we know? Who's the, old? the old man's the old nature, sin nature. That's why you'll you'll never hear me say that I am a sinner saved by grace. Now, I I will agree. I couldn't have got saved if it wasn't for grace. So I was saved by grace. You may hear me say I was a sinner saved by grace. But I'm not a sinner. You know why? 
My nature changed. You know, ironically, all Christendom believes what I just said, is that when you get saved, you give up your old nature for a new nature. You leave a kingdom of darkness, you come into a kingdom of light. Yet they teach the church, you're sinners saved by grace. You're not. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You're his beloved, his children, a part of his family. He is your father. If he is your father, you can't be a sinner. I'm Paul's father. He cannot be a Holland. Now, there's nothing wrong being a Holland. Was not making that comparison, John. You understand? Right. Yeah, he, yeah, he, could, he can't be one. Why? Because I'm his father. All right. Should have used somebody outside the church. <laughs> the changing of nature. Having put on the new man who's renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him. So we're going to talk about some of that knowledge that we have need of. See, we live in a time where character has been replaced with personality. Personality. We're looking for, we're looking for a leader who has charisma. A lot of polish, a lot of shine. I have charisma, I like to think. But the other side of that is, you could have no charisma. I'm not talking about spiritual endowments, you understand. All right? Personality, they're feisty. They're strong-willed, hard-headed. They're sweet. They're happy-go-lucky. That's personality. Marge, we're born with personality. You don't get virtue until you're born again. Somewhere in the 20th century, we, we, we shifted. There, there was a, when you look into the writings of the 18th and the 19th century, both within the church, and if you see where they're, where, where they're talking about, even to men in manhood. And do you understand, you're talking about a male-dominated world. You know, they, you know, you didn't see as many things written, you know, in general to the whole population. But they would always talk about these virtues. Character. Dignity. Integrity, honesty. Today, everything's about self help. It's all about me. How can I be a better me? Now, there's nothing wrong with personality. We all like people with good personalities. I mean, you know, I, I mean, that's, that's great. But you can't replace virtue or character with personality. See, personality is this. Personality is what you are outwardly. I want to talk to see, 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 we can raise kids, and we might do some things that would help them with their, with their personality. If they were short with people all the time, you'd say, honey, just don't be short. People see you as rude. and Don't be like that. And that's great, all right? But the personality is what everybody sees. You know, we live in a time where you're famous just for being famous. I'm irritated that the Kardashians become wealthy. Yeah. People are wealthy. They, 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 have, they don't have any character. Personality is an outward expression. Character is this. It's an inward discipline. See, if a nation is about to go to war, you don't want a person with charisma. You want a person with character. If your child's going to go intern somewhere, you don't want somebody with charisma. You want somebody with character. If somebody's going to teach your children and they're going to spend eight hours a day with them for over 200 days a year, you don't care whether or not they got charisma. You want them to have character. See, we have a, we've abandoned the character. For what? The personality. Far too many times. We look for a political leader. It's the guy with what? Charisma. Or the woman with charisma. We look for, we look for a, 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 a superintendent or a, a, a man to lead a plant. We're looking for somebody who's got charisma, personality. 
And we're always glad if they do. There's nothing wrong with good personality. We all rather be around people with good personality. But ultimately, we're looking for this virtue, this character, this, what, this inward discipline. This is what we want to teach our children. It doesn't make any difference whether or not your children can dance. It doesn't make any difference whether or not that they know how to celebrate when they hit a home run. It does make a difference if they know how to live in a world that is opposed to all the things that you're trying to teach them. Uh That's right. Colossians says, for you've died, your your life is hidden in Christ. I want to mention that again at the end. If you died, your life is where it's hidden in Christ. Virtue is this. Virtue is God's personal impression upon the heart. His personal impression. See, all the time, impressions are being made upon our lives. Uh, Leon's son-in-law, uh, Chris Abeda, Chris was, 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 was born into a, uh, a Hispanic uh, home. You know, as a young boy, his dad was, uh, was Hispanic. His grandparents were Hispanic. And, and as a very young boy, they spoke at home predominantly Spanish. But then they, their family was broken, and, and, and Chris and his siblings uh, were, were raised predominantly by his mom. And so for years, I'm not saying he was exposed to no Spanish at all, but just a minimal amount. Years later, he goes to the mission field, and he goes to Mexico. After just a few days in Mexico, he's speaking Spanish like he'd been around it all his life. You know why? Because when he was young, somebody made an impression. He can preach in it now. Why? Because when he was young, somebody made an impression. That's why we're talking about virtue. That's why we're going to give these Bibles out. Why? It's so that we can make some sort of impression. Virtue is God's personal impression upon the heart. Character in the Greek almost looks like, and you know, almost phonetically would, would, would sound the same. But character originally meant this, an engraved mark. For you and I, a symbol or imprint on the soul. That's what virtue is. What a wonderful thing to think that, it, that upon the life of a young person that you might make an imprint of kindness. Or you might make an imprint of patience. Or you might make an, uh, uh, an, an imprint of honesty. Once again, these virtues, character, is God's imprint upon our lives. In Luke, the 20th chapter, they, uh, they come to Jesus one time, and they're, you know, they're talking about Caesar and who should we serve. They thought they'd catch Jesus in a trap. They told him, whoa, you're such a spiritual man, man. You, you really hear from God. And they think, well, now we'll get him to say something he shouldn't say, and they'll arrest him. Who should we serve? And he said, well, show me a denarius or show me a coin. Whose portrait and inscription is on it? Caesar's, they replied. The Message Bible says this. He said, show me a coin. Now this engraving or this impression, who does it look like? What does it say? See, when, when it, you and I are made in the image of God and in the likeness of God. And so if you and I, as new creatures in Christ Jesus, we might look at one another and we'd say, whose image is here? Whose impression upon our lives? What does that impression say? Jesus looked at the coin. They all replied, said, Caesar. He said, well, then give Caesar what belongs to Caesar. We give God what belongs to God. Taxes belong to Caesar. You pay Caesar your taxes. I don't jump up and down about that, but that's what we do. <laughs> but, what the, but the heart belongs to who? Belongs to God. See, when you get your belief right, you get your behavior right. Yeah. 
Got to get your belief right first. Now this engraving, who does it look like? You might say, you might say to yourself, this engraving, what does it look like? You might look at your child and say, this engraving, what do I want it to look like? What do I want it to look like? Proverbs 22, 6, a real familiar verse. Anybody who's ever parented, uh, it's been taught out of over and over again for many good reasons. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he'll not what? Hey. Like Leon's son-in-law, Chris. He learned Spanish as just a young boy. Spent around 12 or 13 years, not in a home where they spoke Spanish every, every day, but young when he was old. The impression was made. All came back to him. Train up a child in the way they should go. You make the right impressions while they're young. Believing that those impressions are an indelible mark upon their lives. And they'll return. My granddaughter's in the room. She speaks both English and, and Chinese. And she's, you know, she's, she's fluent in both. She's a little bit more fluent in Chinese than she is English. But very good. Writes both, both languages. They live in the United States now. This would never happen because her and her mom, most of the time when they, they converse, that most of the time it's in Chinese. And so she'll never have a time where she went. But let's just say that she never heard Chinese again for the rest of her life, but that impression's been made. She'll always understand it. She'll always identify with it. She'll always be able to read it. Nobody will ever wonder if she had been influenced by the Chinese language and culture or the Taiwanese, whichever the case might be. Train up a child in the way they should go. You and I, once again, are endeavoring to make these impression upon our children's lives, and while they're young, they are so impressionable. It is absolute. In one hand, you could say that's so, that's so bad that they're so impressionable. The other side of that is if you do it well, it's so good. You know, as, as Christians in, within Christianity, we're often accused, you know, and, and, and you may get accused of this as a parent when your child becomes a certain age called a teenager. <laughs> and you may be accused of brainwashing your kids. It's amazing that the world could feed them all kinds of garbage and it's not brainwash. Yeah. R.C. Sproul was talking to, a, it was a graduate class. It was a philosophy class, but they got off on the subject of, of evolution. Did I tell you it was a graduate class? And finally, they asked R.C. about this. He said, this, said, uh, said, well, why don't you believe in evolution? Oh, I forgot to tell you, it's a Christian college. How come you don't believe in evolution? Why do they all believe in evolution? Wait. So he says, oh, well, well I'm, I'm, he walked to the board. He took the chalk. He says, well, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to walk here to the board, and you're going to give me a list of reasons to believe in evolution. So he walks to the board, and he takes out his pencil. He says, all right, somebody give me the first one, and he writes one on the board. Did I tell you as a graduate class? Nothing. Finally, one young man says to him, says, uh, he says, well, you know that there's a, you know, there, there is a, there's a common strand of DNA that runs through all this. He said, well, all right, that's, that's pretty good. At least it's an answer. And he said, but could it be that they also have a common origin? The guy said, well, yeah, I, I guess it could be. He says, okay, what's number two? Nothing. Crickets. He says, come on, guys, why is it that you're so strong and you feel like that I'm so out in left field believing in evolution? Why do you believe in evolution? You know what it came down to? It's what we were taught in high school. They were what? Brainwashed. Moving right along. Don't think I didn't enjoy that. <laughs> Listen to me, if you're out there and you've not heard me teach on this before, there... Uh, Darwin said this himself. Now, when, when he passed away, he knew that everything he taught was a theory. It was not a fact. He knew everything that he said was a theory. All right? Darwin didn't believe, die believing these things were a fact. He, I'm not saying he was, you know, this 
patron saint, but he died believing it was a theory. But this is what Darwin said, John. He said, in the years to come, the fossil record will prove whether I'm right or wrong. You know what the fossil record has proved? He's wrong. Nobody wants to talk about the fossil record. You understand? If we've been on this earth for billions of... Now, I'm not the 6,000-year guy, all right? And I can disprove that in a heartbeat, all right? But here's the deal. If we've been here for billions and billions and billions of years, or even if man's been here for millions and millions and millions of years, where's the fossil record for all the people who died? Where's the fossil record for all these animals that evolved? It doesn't what? Exist. Moving around along. I, I've spent too much time doing that. Okay. <clears throat> Everyone that comes to faith takes on a new nature. Now that new nature, okay, must be this. For those of us that are parents, we have to nurture it. Nature has to be nurtured. Virtues, they're there, but they must be nurtured. It's like an athlete. My son Ryan was a great hitter. That kid could hit a ball. But he didn't care. It wasn't something he was interested in developing. Once he learned he could do it, he was fine. Hey, I can do that. Now, had he developed that, you know, he just he, he would have really, you know, he, he just really would have been a really good hitter, all right? And uh, so, but 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 it was never nurtured. Didn't say dad who loved baseball didn't try, okay? <laughs> but it wasn't his interest, all right? Now he's also very musical. And he can play any number of instruments, any number of instruments. Why? It was nurtured. What's nurtured in a life ends up growing and developing. You can, you can have a propensity for something. When we are born again, we were, we were born again with honesty, and we were born again with integrity and patience and kindness, with godliness. We're born again with these virtues, but they must be nurtured. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God is one God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. These are the commandments that I give you to be upon. Everybody say upon. upon. Wonder why it's upon the heart. Did you ever think about that? Why upon the heart, Marge, and not in the heart? Words mean something. I'm going to give you the answer, though. You didn't think I'd bring it up and not give you the answer. <laughs> These commandments that I give you today should be upon your heart because you're going to what? Impress them. You'll make an impression upon the heart. So you can make an impression in another person's life on the way that you live and the way that you conduct yourself and the way that you handle yourself. Certainly as a parents and grandparents, that is absolutely what we're called to do. Is to what? Is to, make, is, is to help the divine impression upon their lives. You what? You impress it upon the heart. What is it? It's character. Character means what? To engrave something. An impression upon the soul. Upon the inward man, that hidden man. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when they sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lay down and when you get up. What are we doing? Making an impression. I've circled that. Make an impression. See, it's our job. We're talking about this as a family service. We're, we're talking to everybody. These are things that are important for each and every one of us, but we're, 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 we're talking to those of us who are, who are parents, if we're a grandparent, if you're an aunt or an uncle, everybody's an influence on someone's life, but in relationship to our families. It's our job as parents to awaken the gifts of character in ourselves and in our children's lives. Remember this, it's said in the scripture, it says our, 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 our lives, our lives are, are hidden Christ. Remember that? Our lives are hidden Christ. I did this, I did this years, bef years before in a little bit different way. But I'm, I'm going to do this this morning. Uh, Ryan, why don't you, you come? Get me eight other people, Ryan, if you'll do that. Get me eight other people while I'm reading. Just random, doesn't make any difference. Remember, once again, our lives are hid in Christ. I need a total of nine. I'm going to turn over here to, uh, to Galatians, the fifth chapter. You know, in Galatians chapter five, it, it tells us this. It says, for the fruit of the Spirit is, is love, joy, 
Verse 22. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such that there is no law. Now, once again, the, the goal as a believer, certainly, you know, most of the time you'd, you'd say to people, what's the goal as a believer? To reach the world. But that's, that's, that's kind of number two. The first goal, would you agree, Marge, to become like Christ? To become like him? To be more like him? Sure. To live him out every day? Remember, our life should be hidden Christ. We've got a new nature. Now, the only way to hide the life in Christ, you know, we all got a past. Anybody here don't have a past? We get some smelling sauce for you if you do. <laughs> all right. But see, if we take all these things, all right? All right. Help us out. Ryan, put these people in front of me. I'll stand right here. <clears throat> Ryan, we need somebody to represent love. We need somebody to represent love. All right? Okay. Get them right in front of me. All right? All right. And then we need somebody to represent joy. We need someone to represent joy. All right. I'd like to have a little more joy. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm just joking. I'm, he's my buddy. I could kid with him. Okay. I'd like to kid. It's all fun. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, his mom's on the front row glaring at me. No, she's not. I made that up. All right. I need somebody. I need peace. Peace. I'll do this quicker. I need, I, need, I, need, I need patience. Help me, Jesus. And patience. Well, we don't have to lie. We'll, 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 we'll come back here. What we're trying to do is we'll make a crowd around me. Make a crowd around me here. A crowd around me. I didn't give very good instructions here. I need some, I need some peace, uh, some patience. Uh, I need some gentleness. I need a little gentleness. to Gentleness. Gentleness. Did you really make John gentleness? That's a stretch. Oh, no, no, Jesus. All right. No, I'm just kidding. He's a good All right. Okay. We need goodness. Goodness. I need some goodness. All right. I, I need some faithfulness. Oh, yeah. I need some self-control. All right. Okay. Now, here's what happened. Call come in here pretty close is that you see when you get this divine nature working in your life, pretty soon you're just in the background. And what do you see? You see love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and kindness and patience. Against such there is no law. All right? There's no limit to it. All right? What you do is it what you really see, instead of just seeing Bill, you see Christ. Instead of just seeing Bill, you see his body. The church. Our lives are what? Our lives are hidden Christ. And what you and I are trying to do, all right, is to become more like him. And as we, as we grow these things in my life, I'm working on joy. And as we grow these things in our lives, all right, as we grow these things in our lives, we become more like him. Can you say amen? amen. Give these guys a hand. Amen. I'm trying really hard. Okay. When we go downstairs, last year, we gave out the children's training Bible. And those things would help you in relationship to when your child had certain disciplines that you needed to, to do in their, their, their lives, you know, so you could open it up and it might deal with the subject of disobedience or, or lying or something of that nature. But then on the other hand, we're talking about how absolutely important it is to become more like him. Often say that the Old Testament is thou shalt not. And the New Testament is thou shalt. Amen. The Old Testament's about what you shouldn't do. The New Testament is about everything you should do. Well, this is not just a New Testament. It's a complete Bible. It's from Genesis to, to Revelations. Right. And, and this is what they refer to as a virtue training Bible. These things were put together with a tremendous amount of effort, care, and love. People spent hours and hours putting these together to do this, to put a tool in someone's hand. So, so Brittany's going to get one of these, and Brittany put several of these together. But Brittany will have one of these at home. And this is a tool to make an impression upon their children's lives. 
And so that her and Jeff, if, 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 if they want to, if they want to talk about, uh, if they want to talk about honesty, well, you know, they could get their, they could get their, uh, their thing out here and they could look at honesty and honesty says, well, one of the verses we could turn to is in Psalms, the 15th chapter. And it says, and he walks blamelessly and does what was, what is right. And he speaks truth in his heart. You know what's great about that verse? So here's this thing you could talk to your kids about. Here's what's great about that verse. It doesn't say that he just did the right thing, but he had the right heart and the right attitude about it. See, honesty is this. Honesty is an integrity yeah. of the heart. Yes, amen. Well, see, those are things. The Bible says this to you and I. Faith cometh by what? Hearing. hearing. Isn't that right? Faith comes by hearing. Well, if you hear about these virtues enough time, faith rises in your heart. You begin to believe that you can be kind or you can be gentle or you can be honest. Or you could persevere or you could be merciful. You know, the list goes on. There are 42 virtues here, and I wouldn't say that's an exhaustive list. All right? There are nine fruit of the Spirit listed in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 22. But making these, once again, taking and, and making the, the, this impression. So you'll see all those colored tabs. Ours. Almost every page, many of the pages have multiple marks on them. And you might get one of these and seem, wow, it seems so confusing. Except when you open up the very first page. There it is. There's kind of a key. This key says compassion, contentment, courage. Devotion to the word, diligent, discernment. You say you're an adult. You say, I need one of these. You could make one. <laughs> Encouragement. You understand? You go all the way around. And you could follow those tabs. And once again, you could find a verse. But you know what? It's made easier than that. You don't just have to follow the tabs. Each one of those three corners has a key. This is the key for the front page. Coming off the very front of it. The top three are about the Trinity, godly speech, gospel, holiness, honesty, hope. I won't read the whole list. But if you look on the back side of that, you will find all the verses for godly speech. And then it will be easy to find. It will be easy to find because, first of all, you can grab that, ta that, that tab and you say, whoa, uh, read First Peter. I know that's not at the back of the book. It's at the front of the book. Well, you start looking for the red tabs at the front of the book. It'll take you to 1 Peter, and it'll give you the address. Well, that's true about every one of them. So you, once again, you could take that, and that's true. There's one for the top, compassion, commitment, courage. And then there's one, there's one for the bottom, which is patience, peace, perseverance, praying, purity, self-control. Just dawned on me, they're alphabetical. <laughs> Thought you'd like that. Here's something that Selena's put together, what we'll put with them. You know that uh, as a family, now once again, it's, it's a tool. If you take this at home, if you take this at home, you know, I, I told a story before about my, uh, my, my good friend uh, Bill Moore had a, had a guy who pastored here in Texas County. This happened here in Texas County, so this is a homegrown story. So anyway, pastor went to visit family. He said, you know, I always like the, you know, we, he, he got there, and, you know, when, when he got there, people are just scrambling, you know, straighten things up because the preacher showed up. And, and so anyway, he gets done, and he, he feels like he's stayed long enough, and he looks around. He's not seen a Bible anywhere, and they're telling him how much they love the Bible and how much they love God and how much they love to pray. And so when he gets ready to leave, he says, you heard the story, John says, he says, you know, I always like to read from the family Bible. He says, why don't you get your family Bible and let's read. Remember, we love the Word. We just love the Word. We love to read it. The search begins. I mean, they're everywhere. You hear them in the closet. They're upstairs. They're downstairs. They're everywhere. They're looking on the bookshelves. They're under the bed. They're looking for... And finally, after about 10 minutes, from the back of the house, a small voice says, I found it! Man, we don't want this to be that kind of deal. I'm, because of time, I've got to paraphrase the story. You'll have to come again. It's a great story. <laughs> I found it. You know, if we send these home and they end up in a closet somewhere, you know, it's been, it was a tremendous effort. It was a tremendous expense. It's a tremendous tool. What are you trying to do? You're trying to make a divine impression. We'll, we'll spend three hours going to a ball game. And sometimes we'll spend 15 minutes with the Word of God. 
which will make an eternal difference. I tell you this, when most of your kids are done with high school, they're, done with, they're, they're, they're not going to be a professional. All right? They're a citizen for, for heaven forever. All right? Have a good time. It's great. It's wonderful. I was a legend in my own mind when I was young. Have a great time. In, enjoy those things. Don't neglect this. Scripture says, study to show yourself approved, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Man, that child hears about kindness enough times, pretty soon faith arises in their hearts. You model it in front of them. They're going to have opportunities to practice it. When you know what it is and you have opportunities to practice it, that is what it means to nurture, to grow something in someone's lives. So when we get downstairs, everybody's got a child. You know, they're going to get these. These wonderful keys are going to be in it, all right? This harmonically balanced virtue training Bible. I just made that up. <laughs> Holder is going to come along with it, all right? What is it? It's a tool. Remember, you're going to need, we're trying to make what? An impression upon their lives. An impression. You got 18 years to make an impression. Give it the best you can. Yeah. Every head bowed, no one looking yeah. around. We've got to get to communion. But first, you might be here, and maybe you've never made a decision concerning the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, we had a great baptism service this morning. I'm not asking you if you've ever been baptized. Because if I would ask this question last week for the candidates who got baptized, if I would have said, if, if you're here this morning and you've never been saved, except for the one young lady, they were already already saved. I'm not asking you if you've ever been baptized. I'm not asking you if you've ever, ever joined a church. Or if you've got a Sunday school pin. I'm not asking you how many times you've been to VBS. I'm saying, have you ever asked Jesus to take control of your life, to be Lord? Have you fully placed your faith in him? Have you asked him to forgive him for not making him the center of your life? Forgive you for not making him the center of your life. Forgive you of your sin. If you've never done that before we get to communion, we'd like to give you an opportunity to do that. Have you ever said, Jesus, I believe you're God's son, just like we asked those candidates. I believe that you lived a sinless life. I believe that you died on the cross and you died for me. I believe you were buried and that you were raised from the dead. Come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. Take control. Be my Lord. I accept you as Lord of my life. Now, I'm not saying you had to pray just like that. But have you ever fully trusted him and given him control? Have you ever called upon him? If you call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says you'll be saved. Maybe you're here, you say, Pastor, I've known the Lord, but I've wandered in my faith. I've strayed. Well, good, uh, we appreciate your honesty and your integrity. If that's you, in just a moment, we're going to pray. I said, Bill, I've, I, I've known the Lord, but I've not lived like he's Lord of my life. But I get it. I need to. I, 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 I can. I, I, need, I need virtue in my life. We'll get back on the, get back on the bus. We're going to pray. We're going to invite everybody in the room to pray. Let's pray together. Say this with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your son Jesus. I believe that he lived. I believe that he died. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe he was raised from the dead. Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I accept you now as my Lord and as my Savior. I receive forgiveness of sin and the free gift of eternal life. Old things are passed away. Everything's new. Thank you for a brand new heart and a brand new beginning. You're my Lord. I'm your child. In Jesus' name. Amen.